Welcome to the construction process. The thing we've been planning for, excited about, maybe even dreading a little bit, but it's here, so yay. Your job during this time is to confirm that everything is as you expected it to be. Answer any questions that come up, problem solve issues, and generally just watch your dream become a reality. This module is here to help you set realistic expectations about what is happening on your site, whose opinion matters, when to listen to them, and when to trust yourself. As an interior designer, my job is to oversee the construction process from the view of interior design, and that's how we will walk through this module. I'm not trying to tell the contractor how to build the house in the same way that I don't need them telling me which color to paint the walls. We all have our own areas of expertise. We are a team coming together to execute your vision. Construction involves coordinating multiple schedules, material availability, and the weather, all things that are extremely unpredictable. So even in the most prepared and organized project, issues will come up. Things will happen on site, something will be backordered or out of stock, and you can pretty much plan on it. So do not beat yourself up when these things happen. Love your decision, but know that there might have to be some compromises along the way, and that is just construction. I know that probably sounds like a total contradiction to everything I was saying earlier, and that all still applies, so do not let people talk you into things. Be strong in your choices, but know that there are many ways to get things done and achieve the same look. If you thought the design process was hard, get ready to defend every decision you just made. You will question yourself and your design, and it will happen to even the most prepared and confident designer. You must stay strong throughout this process. This is when people get tired and make compromises and changes that they regret later. Things will happen and changes will have to be made, but you can still end up with your original vision. You might just have to take a few detours or come at it from a different direction, but you can get what you want. And sometimes the changes make it even better, so don't be afraid to pivot if it feels right. Just be part of the project, listen to your gut, and stay true to those core wants and needs that you established early in the project. So now let's talk site basics. Now that you have a site, you get to start cleaning it. Yay! <laughs> Your construction crew might do this, which is great, but remember that you are paying them during that time. If you want to save a little money, or if your crew doesn't clean, start cleaning the site yourself or hire a cleaner. It might seem odd when you know there's going to be another mess tomorrow, but it is much easier to clean small messes every day than a huge one at the end of the week, and it will be messy. And it's hard to work in a mess for everybody involved. Construction sites are almost always dirty and muddy, especially in the early phases. Fresh dirt, no water management, no sidewalks or driveways. There's heavy machinery all over the yard and sometimes construction debris. So it shouldn't be a disaster, but yeah, you know, it's going to be messy. Site visits. You do not need to visit the site every day, but I highly recommend regular visits, especially when a new phase begins. Each time you have a new crew like plumbing, electrician, HVAC, meet with them and make sure everyone is on the same page. I like to have a scheduled visit every week that the crew can plan on. Maybe it's every Tuesday morning or whatever works best for you. But the contractor crew and you can save your questions and knock out a bunch of items in a single focused meeting. There will still be emergency calls, but hopefully less. And I always end these meetings with this question and it's super important. What will you need from me in the next meeting to keep moving forward? That's their opportunity to point out where they are going next in construction and if there are any lingering decisions to be made. This is your opportunity to review all those decisions one last time and or do a little research and make a decision if it's something that you forgot about because that will happen. So back to the site visits. Carry a flashlight. There will be no power or lights for quite a while. Bring a tape measure for confirming any dimensions and wear clothing appropriate for the weather and that you can get dirty. You literally might have to slide down a trench, climb up a ladder, or through a window just to get inside. Dirt will be pulled away from your foundation for quite a while, and if you've ever wanted to walk the plank, you will most likely get your chance. Construction sites make every season and temperature more extreme. Be prepared for weather. I have been on walkthroughs of foundation pours where it was so bright and so hot we were like eggs frying on a hot sidewalk, and walkthroughs of interior framing where I thought my fingers might get frostbitten, so... Just prepare yourself. And also, there is no working bathroom for quite a while. Remember this. Do not slam your venti latte on the way and show up needing to go to the bathroom. It makes for a very unproductive site visit. This all applies to remodels as well, especially if you are living on site. There will be times when the power is turned off or there's no water. 
And if the project includes a kitchen or a bathroom, that could be out of commission for a significant amount of time. Clients have set up makeshift homes upstairs, downstairs, in the garage, in the shed, all kinds of crazy places, and some people just move out altogether. So be honest with yourself and what you can tolerate. Do whatever you need to make it through this process because at best, it will be a wild ride with crazy stories to tell that you can hopefully laugh about later. So try to keep a positive mindset and know that this is just a phase that will pass on the journey to your dream home. That brings us to your construction crew. Start getting friendly with these people because, as I mentioned before, they can make or break the success of your project as well as mitigate or add to the stress throughout this whole process. If you are doing a remodel, they are going to be in and around your house at all times of the day, so just say goodbye to privacy for a while. I'm going to paint you a little picture. It's 7 a.m. You're sleepy-eyed in your kitchen, pouring coffee, and Joe the plumber is there already, sitting at your table, chatting about the new toilet he's putting in today. You're glad he's there, but it's also 7 a.m. You're in your robe, and you have not had your coffee yet. Speaking of that, construction crews usually start early, and sometimes it's loud. Prepare yourself and your neighbors because this can become a real issue for people. But understand that there is only so much light and good weather and the typical attitude in construction is make hay while the sun shines. So if you simply cannot have them start before a certain time, make that very clear. If it just annoys you, then I would suggest adjusting your schedule because getting the crew to your site is the number one priority and it can be hard to do. This is something you will notice throughout your project. Once their work is done, the next crew can start and they will have a totally different schedule than the last. Clients have asked, should I provide drinks or food or a bathroom? You can be as hospitable as you would like, but remember, this is their job. This is how they work every day. If it's especially hot and you want to leave a cooler full of water and Gatorades, that's great. But most of them will come prepared with their own because that's what they do every day. You show up to your job prepared and so do they. And they have work to do. The more you are interrupting them, even with good intentions, the longer things are going to take. And some contractors like to talk a lot. So remember, you are paying them typically by the hour and time is money. So if you are chatting with them to humor them, make an excuse to get out of there and just get them back to work. Keep your conversations about the project and leave chatting to the end of the day. Bathrooms. So depending on the size of your project, your contractor might have a porta potty delivered to your site or you can rent one. Most crews will not assume they can use your bathroom, but if you want to offer it, that's totally up to you. Inspections. Depending on your location and project, inspections will happen at different times throughout this construction process. The inspector is there to confirm that everything complies with the city and building industry codes. Their job is a safeguard to make sure your home is being built correctly. They can save your bacon by pointing out errors, but they can also halt construction making the crew redo something, hand out fines, and or cause delays as construction cannot move forward without their consent. This can be a delicate relationship and one to nurture as best you can. So let's get down to the actual construction process. There's a pretty standard set of steps, but the order is quite flexible depending on the weather, inspections, materials, and when crews are available. The order of operations I'm going to give you is not exact, but it's a way to loosely set expectations for this process. Just know that things can definitely change and rearrange. That's part of the construction world. So it's going to go something like this. Site prep. This phase involves a lot of dirt work and heavy machinery. Depending on your site and the amount of work that needs to be done, you will usually see backhoes and bulldozers clearing trees, moving rocks, grading the land, and digging the approximate hole that will be your basement and or foundation. This is relatively the same process if you have a basement, a crawl space, or just slab on grade construction. They might also dig for your septic tank and or well if you're going to have either of those, as well as handle any water issues. This step is very important. If you are remodeling or familiar with the site, make sure everyone is aware of water issues that come and go with the seasons. Now is the time to address them. Is there typically standing water in an area after heavy rains or snow melt? Does the water all pool somewhere that's maybe not ideal? Do you have a sinkhole somewhere? Now is when you fix these issues. Plan on your yard getting torn up and things to be a muddy mess. Next is the foundation. If you are building a new house or adding on to your existing, you will need a foundation of some sort. Once your site is prepped, a concrete company will come in and form up your walls. This will include openings for windows and doors if you have any and might take a few days. Once the forms are up, 
double check measurements before anything is poured and confirm that everything is how you wanted it. If something is off, ask why. If it's just a few inches and you can live with it, no big deal. Sometimes there are issues with the ground or site that restrict construction and are worth a discussion. If they don't have a reason and it's just off, make them fix it. Do not feel bad because it's going to be a lot of work or you're going to annoy them. This is your project and you will have to live with it. If they don't fix it now, everything will be off later. Every decision and change will have multiple consequences, so make it right as soon as you can and save yourself so many headaches later. Your floor plans are based on the original drawing, so if the foundation is poured differently than shown, make sure that you have your plans amended or at least noted to reflect the change. I'm going to give you an example of why this matters. A project I was recently working on, a house foundation ended up slightly larger than originally planned, eight feet larger which is fine, but the plans were never updated. We had to go back and figure out where that extra feet even went and or where we wanted it to go. In this case, a few feet of it ended up in the master bathroom. The plans were never updated to reflect this change. When the windows were installed, the contractor took the measurement from one wall and installed the window. First of all, that plan should have never had an exact measurement. It should have said center on wall. That could have avoided the entire situation because instead of looking at the dimensions, he would have measured the wall and placed the window in the center. In any other situation, this might not have been noticed except we were doing two sinks, one on each side of the window, and the design was very symmetrical. So now it is quite obvious. We did our best to camouflage it with the mirrors and the tile layout, but it shouldn't have been an issue. So anyway, back to the foundation. Things are set and ready to be poured. Typically, you will see large concrete trucks, the ones with the rotating drum on the back, with booms that pour the concrete in place while crews move it around. Then it dries for a day or two, the forms are removed, and it needs to cure for another few days, depending on your location and the weather, so before work can continue. A lot of people will wonder, why is no one working on our site? You can't. Your foundation walls will get poured first, then your plumber will come and lay any drains or piping that needs to be under the foundation floor. If you don't have your whole interior planned yet, that's okay and that happens all the time, but you do need to know where any toilet, sink, and floor drains will be in the basement or if you're going to have any in-floor heat. If you are going to have an unfinished basement, that's fine, but you still want to lay any pipes for future bathrooms or plumbing now. Even if it's just a maybe, have them put the pipes in. Doing it now means a couple of hours and maybe $100 of pipe. Doing it later involves cutting and trenching into the concrete, Laying new pipes, it's super expensive and not ideal. And if you ever had dreams of a beautiful stained concrete floor, forget it. You will always see that massive trench. Once all the under concrete work is done, your floor will be poured. It's pretty much the same process as the walls. And as you will learn with most construction, it's not complicated, but it is a lot of work and requires special equipment. If you are going to have an exposed concrete floor, make sure your crew is aware so they can take special care with the finish. The floor will need to be cured for a few days, again, depending on location and weather, and no work can be completed on the site at this time. So now is the time to relax and just take it in for a few days. This is the footprint of your house, and there is so much raw potential at this time. It is one of my favorite milestones in a project. So enjoy the quiet because it will not last long. And no matter what time of year your project starts, it will be messy during the initial phases of the project. Water and debris will collect. You will get mud running in from window and door openings. And this is generally normal, but definitely talk to your crew and ask as many questions as you need to feel comfortable with what's happening on your site and that everything is being taken care of correctly. Exterior framing. The goal is usually to get the shell up and weather tight as quickly as possible. But this phase does also take time and it's not crazy to get snow inside your house or water puddles in your basement. Until the shell or outside is sealed up, it's just, it's going to happen. It's not really a big deal because it's wide open. It will also dry, but it seems weird and upsets a lot of people to see, especially because we all have this panic, knee-jerk response to seeing weather or water in our brand new house. It's okay. Most projects will be wood framed, otherwise known as stick built, meaning two by four stud framed walls. Although there are other building techniques, post and beam, steel, structural insulated panels, insulated concrete forms, and more, but 
if you are using one of the alternative framing types, I'm going to assume that you or your contractor are familiar with them so you already know about this process. Today we are focusing on wood framing because that is most common. Walls are typically built laying flat on the ground using studs or two by fours and two by sixes that are placed every 16 inches and then raised into place. There will be openings for windows and doors and you should see any architectural elements taking shape. Your job during this process is to look at all the locations of the windows and doors, check the heights of the windows, make sure they're aligning the way you expected, and just generally everything is what you thought it was going to be. At this point, they are only framing the exterior and they will come back around for the interior. Once your exterior walls are up, you can start to better understand the space. A lot of clients panic or second guess themselves at this point because it seems really big. Don't worry, that is totally normal. Measure again just to be sure. Point out any differences from your plan to your crew, make corrections if necessary, but once the interior walls go up, it gets smaller real fast. And then it's usually the opposite reaction. Is it too small? It is not. Again, this goes back to the discussion on construction documents and people not understanding or remembering how big furniture really is and how big and small their current space is. If you want to put your mind at ease during any stage of the process, map out your space or any areas that you are concerned about. Lay two by fours on the floor or mark it out with painter's tape or cardboard boxes. Measure your furniture and put it in there. Whatever it takes to make you feel more comfortable and better visualize your space. And definitely check all the measurements. If a mistake was made or you want to make a change, handle it now or live with it forever. Everything will be built on top of this. So if it's not how you want it now, it will affect every phase that follows. Once the exterior framing is complete, it's a race to make it weather tight. So plywood and other materials will be applied to the exterior of the framing and then the house is wrapped with a waterproof layer and the windows and doors are installed. If you ordered the windows and doors yourself, make sure you check them for any damage and that the sizes and colors are correct well before install day. You would not believe the incorrect orders I have looked over. And if your contractor ordered them, he or she will do this but still look them over yourself. It's better to catch the mistakes now than after they've been installed. Windows and doors can have a long lead time, typically six to eight weeks or more, and are one of the biggest things that can hold up a project. So order them in plenty of time, and if there is something incorrect about your order, take care of it right away. A lot of things are going to be coming and going through your exterior doors, so typically a dummy door is installed. This door will take the brunt of abuse throughout the construction process, and then your real exterior door will be installed at the very end. The next and very important step to being weather tight is a roof. This involves rafters and trusses, typically pre-engineered but sometimes built on site. Confirm that the roofing material is correct, and if you are having multiple roofing materials, just make sure that everyone understands where they go. Other than that, you're just a bystander. The next step in fully weatherproofing your house is the siding. Make sure you check the siding color as well as any trim pieces and that the crew is aware of the final look that you are going for. Other than that, again, you are just watching. Once the outside is weather tight, the crew will start focusing on the inside again. And from this point on, these phases can happen out of order and or all at the same time. So now it's more about when the materials are available and when the crews can get there. Now your interior walls are being framed. So check the measurements and that everything is where you want and expect it to be. Look at the placement of doorways, room sizes, closets, and any other interior architectural features. Once the interior walls are framed, your cabinet maker can come and take official measurements. They will not start anything until the interior walls are established because as we mentioned before, things can be a little off. They will make any adjustments necessary and provide you with a final layout. Look over any changes and once you sign off, they can begin constructing your cabinets. Next are the rough-ins. This is where the crews lay the groundwork inside the walls and will come back later in the project to install the actual fixtures. So electrical. If you were really prepared, you might have marked your construction plan for important electrical locations and heights. If not, now is the time to walk through with your electrician and discuss how you are going to live in this house. Even if you did mark up your plans, it's always good to walk through to make sure everyone is on the same page and discuss any issues that might arise. Where is your TV going? How high will it be mounted? Do you have an office, workout equipment, any odd appliances, an in-home vacuum system, in-floor outlets? Do you want more than the average outlets in the kitchen, bathroom, bedrooms? 
By code, there will be an adequate amount of outlets in each room, but if you want something out of the ordinary, now is the time to point it out. During this phase, the electrician is only running wires through the walls for outlets and lights. They will install a few temporary lights, but that is it. So carry a flashlight with you or your phone, and if you make a site visit in the evening or once interior walls start going up. They will come back to do the final install of lighting fixtures and outlets once the drywall is in, but for now, you are just working with natural lighting. And don't forget about the outside. If you want plugins for holiday lights or landscape lighting or patios, make sure you put those in. And if you didn't note it on your plan, discuss the color of your outlets and light switches. And if you want anything different than the standard faceplate or the cover that goes over the light switch and outlet. Remember when I mentioned contractors giving you their opinions on things? This is when that really starts to come into play. Stand firm in what you want because if they talk you out of those sconces by your mirrors in your master bathroom at this point, they are not going back in later. You might hear, that's not the way we typically do it or that's not standard. I hear that all the time. If you want to be like everyone else, go ahead and make the changes the electrician recommends. They typically have the mindset of, that's how it's always been done, or it worked for everyone else, and ultimately, it's easier that way. If it's a code violation or going to cause you issues later, hear them out. They have a wealth of knowledge about electrical, but not always about design. If they can't give a sound reason except that it's easier this way, tell him or her to do it the way that you want. It is your house. You have to live here after they move on to the next job. You get what you want. Plumbing. Okay, so plumbing is relatively standard by code, but still have a walkthrough with your plumber and discuss the final vision. If you want a trough drain instead of round, or are your faucets wall mounted, point out anything out of the ordinary. Will you want a filtration system in your kitchen, water lines for the fridge, separate ice machine, go over every little detail. And don't forget about water access outside or in the garage. HVAC or your furnace and air conditioning systems, there's not much to do here. It's pretty standard and at this point they are just running ductwork in the walls, but you can discuss where you want the registers and air returns located. You do have some choices. If you don't want to stare at that air return above your TV, you do not have to. Also discuss where the furnace and AC units will go. There are options here too, especially with the AC unit. Are you planning some landscaping or a way to hide the unit? Make sure that it is placed correctly. Insulation. Discuss with your contractor ahead of time what sort of insulation you want to use. There are options and pros and cons with all of them. Discuss the attic space and whether you want to use it for storage, but other than that, you don't really need to be part of this phase, so use this time to finalize finished selections and any other decisions if you haven't already. Drywall. Now that everything inside your walls is complete, the drywall will be hung and then mudding, taping, and sanding begins. The mud and tape cover the seam of the drywall, is sanded, and then another round of mud is applied and sanded again. So depending on the size of your house, this can be a long process, at least a week or more. And it's very dusty no matter the size. If you are doing a remodel, make sure the area is taped off or you will be cleaning up drywall dust from every corner of your house for what feels like forever. This is also not a great time to stop by for a site visit and definitely not in your new black suede boots. Texture is often applied to the drywall. Discuss your options and the look that you were hoping for. Most people think popcorn ceilings and say no texture, but texture has come a long way and you are going to want at least a little bit to help camouflage any imperfections in your wall that may happen because of construction, gravity, and or life. Texture conceals life's little imperfections. Usually a different texture is applied to the ceiling than the walls. You can ask your installers to mock a few samples up or show examples if you need. And prepare yourself. Your brand new perfect drywall will get damaged through construction. Somewhere, at some point, something will happen. Big things are being moved in and out, heavy equipment and tools, furniture, you name it. Corners will break, edges might crumble, but that is just the way it is with construction. It can be fixed and it will look like it never happened when all is said and done, or at least it should. So do not lose your shit when you see some damage. Just to reiterate, most of these phases can be done out of order or simultaneously, depending on the size of your crew and schedule of your subcontractors, especially on the phases moving forward. Painting and wall finishes. New drywall absorbs a lot of paint. 
It will be primed at least once, if not twice, depending on your final color, and plan for two coats of your final color, maybe three. Often your primer is applied with a sprayer so they can just run through the whole house, including ceilings and closets. Again, not a great time to have a site visit. Your ceilings and closets need to be painted as well. If you didn't spell out a color, the painter typically has a standard white and it's usually a flat finish. If you're not particular about that white, you can usually trust your painters to have a great neutral white color. If you have a variety of colors throughout the home, make sure it's crystal clear for your painters because that can get confusing fast. If you see streaks or areas where the wall is not fully covered after the painting is done, let them know, but have them come back when the project is farther along. There are bound to be some scuffs and scratches throughout the remaining project that will need to be touched up. And it is not uncommon to schedule your painters to do touch-ups at the end of the project, even before there are damages, because we just all know that there's going to be something. Once the drywall is up and primed, wall tile and wallpaper can also be installed. Cabinet install. So this is an exciting part of the project. All the work you did figuring out your cabinetry every little nook and cranny and now it's finally being installed. They might deliver them all at once and then install or work room by room. Depending on the size of your cabinet shop, they may just have to work room by room because they don't have room in their own shop. Either way, a lot can happen in a few days or all in one day at this stage. Your countertops, again, will not be measured until the cabinets are in. This catches a lot of people off guard, especially if they are using a quartz product. Again, walls can be off and not totally square, so they wait to do any countertop cuts until the layout is final. If you are using a quartz product, especially from the company Cambria, it might be a separate installer who comes and measures and then creates your countertop. The lead time starts now. You could be waiting a few weeks at this point. But the idea is measure twice, cut once. And as much as that sucks, if you are using a super high-end, expensive material, no one wants to pay for that mistake. Or if you selected your specific granite slab and there is just no other one like it, then you absolutely better get it right the first time. It's good to have your appliances on site when your cabinets are installed as well. They can be test fit and or installed right away and any slight modifications can usually be handled on site. Cabinet installers have all sorts of tricks and tips to finish things off looking fabulous even if there are few hiccups in the process. Okay, so now the finish electrical and plumbing. Now your electrician can come back to install lights, outlets, all the stuff. Discuss anything that came up since he was here last, but ultimately this phase is just finishing everything that you talked about before, so it should just be business as usual. You'll want to confirm the height of all pendants, chandeliers, and lighting fixtures, and you might wanna be on site when the final installation happens if you're not sure, because a lot can be tweaked during that install and Sometimes you just have to see it in the space. Also confirm the color of your outlets and light switches before they are all installed and what the face plate looks like or the cover around the light switch and outlet. There are some that are super cool, but they have a long lead time. It's a weird thing to be waiting on. Now that your cabinets are in, your plumber can come back and finish the plumbing. They'll install the faucets, the bathtubs, the showers, connect the sinks, the refrigerator, just all that kind of buttoning up stuff, and it's all coming together. Once your walls are finished, the trim can start going up. Make sure you are clear on your style of trim, how the components stack together, if there are any decorative elements that you are adding, and if there are any areas that are being treated differently. The trim is typically nailed into place with an air nailer, leaving small holes that need to be filled, and then the final finished coat is applied to the trim in place. This is always a discussion who paints or finishes that final coat of trim. It could be your painters, could be someone on the contractor's crew, could be the cabinet company, and it could be you. So it's worth having the discussion. All those interior architectural details get installed now too. Fireplace mantles, faux beams, interior doors, wall tiles, all those details that you spent weeks selecting and giving a crazy amount of mental space to are installed like snap. Your house goes from this big empty space to feeling like your home real quick at this stage and your vision is coming to life. Some of your flooring might have been installed earlier but it cannot be finalized until the cabinets are in. Typically there is no flooring under your cabinets. Meet with your installer and confirm the material obviously, make sure it's the correct size and color but also the install direction and pattern you are expecting. 
Usually you will have talked about this already, but make sure you're all on the same page. Depending on when your flooring is installed, it might be covered with paper to protect it throughout the rest of the project. Paper. <laughs> Carpet is usually one of the last things to get installed to keep construction dust and debris off of it as much as possible. And it can also be covered with the paper for protection. Once the flooring is installed, then the floor trim can go in. The floor trim or baseboard is the component that neatly covers that line between the drywall and the floor, hiding those rough cuts and or any floor level changes. Even in the most contemporary of houses, do yourself a favor and use some sort of floor trim. It's extremely hard to get a perfect line from the drywall to the floor. Walls are not always straight, happens all the time and it's totally normal. Cuts are not always perfectly clean. There's so many things. It can be done, but you are going to pay a lot more for it. So if you don't like the look of trim, my suggestion is to go as minimal as possible and have it painted the same color as the wall. And then it's all the interior details, all those odds and end things, the closet systems, the pantry shelves, the window blinds, vanity mirrors. There's a lot of activity and a lot to coordinate on the site at this time. And your HVAC, so your furnace and air conditioner will finally be turned on. Typically, you do not want to fire up your new systems until the project is generally completed and cleaned up. You will even have a duct system clean. You do not want to start sucking drywall dust into your brand new furnace. No matter when they start it up, make sure to change the filter more often during the first few months as there will be more than the typical amount of dust and debris still in the air and duct work. And while the interior is being finished, the exterior is probably being worked on as well. Landscaping, sidewalks, your driveway, all the curb appeal. Make sure that you have house numbers and a mailbox. And last but not least is the punch list. This is an important tool for homeowners and is something commonly used in commercial construction. As the project is coming to an end, walk through the house and look at everything, and I mean everything. Start this list early and keep adding to it. Note anything that is unfinished or that you're not happy with and go over this list with your contractor. It's easy for them to miss little things when looking at the entire scope of the project. And once the crew is gone, you're not going to get them back. Instead of constantly reminding your crew of these little things, give them the list and often final payment is reserved until this list is completed. It's usually things like patching and repainting drywall where it was damaged during construction, missing light bulbs from the electrician, a leaky faucet that needs to be tightened, missing register covers. It might seem nitpicky, but it's all part of the process, and these things are often overlooked and will end up bugging you the most when it's all done. Your contractor might want to photograph your home for future marketing, and sometimes they will share this cost with other subcontractors who want to do the same. This is totally up to you if you want to allow that, although check your contract because it may have already been in there. And then that's it. The crews pack up and go, and the structure is complete. Sit back and enjoy your new fabulous dream home. Some people throw a completion party and invite all the crews to see the final project, which is fun if you are still on good terms with everyone, but whatever you do, just enjoy this moment. Do not worry about the furniture that you need to buy, the stuff you need to move, or anything else that needs to be done yet. That will come, but for now, enjoy this wide open space. There's no clutter. There's no stuff. It's just a beautiful home ready for you to live your best life. You did it. You made your dream into a reality. Just let that sink in for a bit. 